The best way to find out if you trust someone is to trust them. Ernest Hemingway said that. This is Walking Your Talk, a personal development podcast about leadership, authenticity, and courage. I'm Carolyn Taylor, and I've spent my life working with leaders in organizations on how to change their culture. But this is much more personal. If you want to be known as someone who walks your talk at work and beyond, then this podcast is for you. In this episode, which is the final in the series that we've been doing on empowerment, I want to cover the factors that conspire to make empowering others actually rather difficult, even when you are convinced that it's a good thing to do. I have found in all the work I do with leaders that there are not many for whom empowering is a natural process. And I think in essence, this is because those competencies and the instincts that have actually helped all of us to get into leadership positions and which drive so many elements of our success are not necessarily the ones that facilitate empowerment. And I think they all find that this is true if you started your own business, which I've done twice actually, and grown it to the point where you had a whole team of people who you were employing, or if you join an organization, made your mark, and then got promoted and are now in a position of leadership. Both those circumstances, I think there are a set of abilities that you showed which were incredibly useful, but which may not now help you in the role of an empowerer. And so let's have a look at what some of those are. Well, first of all, there's the ability to get things done. Let me tell you, you start a business, you're a one-person band, you absolutely have to be good at getting things done. And the better you are at doing that, the faster, the more efficient, the more creative, the more innovative, the more your business tends to grow. And if you're in a large organization, you come in, you make a big impression, you get things done quickly, you know, you get on the high promotion list quite quickly. So getting things done is one. Fixing problems, I think, is another. Again, if you're in a small business, there's no one else to fix them, so you fix them yourself. If you're in a larger business, somebody who is able to make that cut through and fix problems within the complexity of a matrix and all the other elements that conspire against fixing problems in large organizations, then you again make a big impact. I think there's also an ability that we have to impress and to influence others, whether those are clients, whether it's your superiors, whether it's people in other parts of the organization whose support you need to get things done. Certainly the ability to impress others is a factor that makes it easier for you to get promoted into a leadership position. And then the other one I'm thinking is, you know, the ability to make decisions without having all the information, to take risks, to pivot when things go wrong. All of those things cause you to be somebody who is successful and tends to move up in an organization and have people sitting underneath you and to be in a position where empowerment then becomes important. So when I observe my clients in meetings, which is something that I often do, it's a service that I offer, I notice how easily these characteristics come into the fore. So a problem gets discussed in a team and I watch the temptation to offer the solution. It's very, very strong. And I know I have this characteristic. So my husband Pete will often talk something through with me and I immediately offer him a solution. Now, Actually, what I discover when he starts to explain it to me in either very friendly or somewhat frustrated terms is actually he wasn't looking for a solution, thank you very much. He's quite capable of coming up with his own solution. What he wanted was an ear. He just wanted to chew something through with somebody whose opinion he respects and who he loves. Now, he's quite strong, so he'll push back and he'll say that. He'll say, no, no, I don't want you to. Don't try and solve this for me. I drive him nuts about it, actually. But if I was his boss, maybe he wouldn't push back. Maybe he would kind of go along with my suggestion. And there we have it. 
There's a pattern of behavior that gets built between us. The boss comes up with the answer and the team member becomes more compliant, kind of actually gets to know that the boss is going to come up with an answer. So maybe gets a little bit lazier in terms of what they think through before they come and talk it over. So when someone says to me, and they often do, you know, my people, they just won't step up. You know, they won't take ownership. I can't tell you the number of times that that's been the motive for someone to call up and say, I want to choose something over. I think I need some help. You know, my people need to take more ownership. And they're very much seeing that the challenge is in my people, not necessarily seeing the role that they're playing in that dynamic. So where I always go is what is that leader's pattern? That's why I love to do so much observation. What is the pattern of behavior that the leader has that is actually contributing to the very thing that she's saying she doesn't want, which is people not stepping up and taking ownership, not being empowered? In many organizations, larger organizations, this dynamic, this sort of pattern becomes so established that it actually becomes a culture. So even if you have a new, more naturally empowering set of bosses, that people have actually lost the habit of being empowered and being entrepreneurial. And it has to be encouraged and recreated. I actually read something a while ago that when the Berlin Wall came down and East Germany and West Germany were united again, that it took you know, almost a generation for the East Germans who had got into the habit of not making a lot of decisions for themselves, of not being encouraged to be entrepreneurs, to refine that entrepreneurial spirit because it had become a part of the culture. Whereas now there's a great spirit of entrepreneurship and go get it and make things happen in Eastern Europe. But for a while there, there wasn't. So that really is how culture gets created. It becomes a pattern of behavior that is established between two groups of people that then happens so often that even if you change the people in those two groups, the pattern of behavior continues. But either party can change that dynamic. We've spoken in previous episodes about how the empowee can start to grab empowerment and start to become more empowered under their own steam. But here I want to talk a little bit more about what the leader has to do in order to make that happen. So here's the exercise for this week. Step one, redefine your role. Don't think of yourself anymore as the problem solver, the decision maker, the fixer, the get things done person. But think about your role as the empowerer and measure your success, not by how many things you fix, but by how many people you build in your team, in your organization, who you do trust and who actually can make decisions that take your business forward in a way that works. Second part of the exercise, and this links actually to the episode we had last week where I introduced a model for gradually increasing the level of empowerment that your people have, is to go back, listen to that exercise again, think about how you've gone, and looking at your team, decide who are the people who you still feel are a long way from being in that position where they can make decisions rather than you having to get involved and work out a strategy and a tactic for each one of them. And the third step is to really look at your relationship with trust. Where does that mistrust come from? Is it really based on the fact that you have people who are not good enough? Or is it a pattern of thinking for you where you've always tended to go to, well, I just can't trust people. And if I want something done well, the thing is to do it yourself. I remember my mother saying that. If you want something done well, Carolyn, do it yourself. That wasn't terribly helpful to make me a great leader and a great empowerer. So look at that relationship with trust. And is it yours? Is it something that you've got to let go of? Or is it genuinely that you have a bunch of people in your team who are not good enough or not good enough yet? And if they're never going to be good enough, then of course, we have to look at whether or not they should be in your team at all. Because you continually coming in and rescuing them by solving the problem is actually covering up 
perhaps the fact that they are not in the right role. So those are the three steps. Redefine your role. Look again at what is it going to take to lift people up so that they are ready to take decisions on their own. And look at your relationship to who you trust and who you don't and take action accordingly. So let's end this series on empowerment by going back to the fundamental question. Why empowerment? Why bother? I think I'd like to end with two answers to that. One is for the empowering. People who feel empowered, who feel in control, who feel that they're running their own destiny, are more motivated, they love life more, they're more engaged, everything just works better for them. Feeling like a victim and feeling helpless is not a good place to be in your life. So being stretched by being empowered is a great thing. But what about you as the empowerer, as the leader in this situation? What do you get out of it? I found that what I get out when I do this well is just a huge lifting of a burden, of a feeling that it isn't all on my shoulders and that I can step back and step up and take more of a helicopter view and start thinking much more long term for what's going to be good for my business, where do we need to go, what else is possible, and to have that headspace which allows one to do that. And that can only be done when the roles that I used to play in the past have been handed over to others who I can fully trust. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on empowerment. Let's start a conversation. Look me up on LinkedIn, Carolyn Taylor. And if you've got something out of this, you can subscribe or share it with others. Next week, we're going to start on customer centricity. I thought it was time to bring the customer into this. Until then, I hope you have a good week. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you then.